Yeah, let's begin the meeting. Uh, call the forming our Senate Steering Committee to order at like probably 503. And if the clerk can call the roll, please. Uh, Lori Wilshire. Here. Judy Carlson. Here. Lindsay Rinaldi, I believe, is going to be joining us a little bit late. Marianne Louise Golia, again, I believe, will be joining us a little bit late. Rich Lannan. Here. Mary Lou Blazer. Here. Trish Clee. Here. Tracy Hall will not be joining us this evening. Mark Thayer will not be joining us this evening. Mayor Jim Donches. Here. And then finally, Brandon Long. Here. One, two, three, four. Seven members present, you have quorum. Terrific. Uh, welcome everybody else um, and other guests here. But So Ned or whoever is, I guess, we'll turn it right over to you and let you get started. Excellent. Uh, well, so we're, we're really transitioning from the our special space programming into the very early stages of the schematic design phase. Uh, thank you for all the feedback we got on the space program after your last meeting. That was very helpful. Um, I understand that the technical subcommittee has been formed. 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 Uh, we can, uh, after this meeting, if, if Joe, uh, if you have questions for Joe, we can ask about that. Otherwise, the plan is to have a meeting with the subcommittee, uh, I think principally via teleconference, uh, next Wednesday. So I think with that, we'll jump right into uh, John's right. next presentation. Uh, well, I also um, want to say Gary Martinez is on the, the conference line. Okay. And um, Jonah, are you there as well? Hello, I am. OK, so Jonah, our acoustician, is there. And, um, so we have everybody to listen, and, and they can participate as well. Um, so the agenda for this evening's m meeting is to really just kind of recap um, and respond to the comments that we received at the end of la last week. Uh, thank you very much for those. Um, and show you how we've incorporated those comments into refining the blocking diagrams that we showed you last time. Um, and just kind of quickly go through that. And um, then move into talking about the issues that we are dealing with currently. Um, from the site and building perspective and uh, kind of show you how we are looking at the, the house, the design and the form of the house and the stage and how that begins to, how we're understanding that's fitting into the existing conditions that we've now documented and incorporated into our computer model um, and what opportunities and constraints we're recognizing because of that. and. We're going to look at kind of two different um, approaches to the seating and um, kind of get a, a sense of what you all feel about uh, either of those. And then just we've kind of just briefly um, and are just starting to look at some of the exterior massing uh, studies. You know, we've, we've seen kind of that box that was popped up um, in the graphic that we did in the interview, but um, we have, you know, as we get into designing it, there are different ways that we, that, that can be handled. Um, so we're going to go through those and then talk about the, the schedule. So uh, let's jump right in unless anybody has any questions. Oh, okay. No, let's do it. All right. So um, to start, just a kind of a recap of the comments and uh, our responses, there was, and uh, Tim sent through a very nicely articulated list of the comments. So this, uh, these two slides are 22 of those comments kind of distilled down to kind of brief points. So uh, there was a mention of a trap room and a question of how much that might cost. Is it a value to, the, uh, to this venue? Is it something that we might need or benefit from? Um, Joe had uh, kind of a response to that. that yeah, I'll just uh, in, in, the, uh, in the initial program, the program that you saw that, uh, that I did, uh, I said trap room and I said none, just so people knew that there wasn't one. Because given uh, 
our understanding of the program and the users uh, and you know budget and space restraints uh, is not something uh, that, that uh, seemed to be essential. But then as we were starting to look at the blocking diagrams, there seemed to be you know a lot of space in the basement. So uh, what I said last time and, and still say is, you know, if, if, if it's basically found space, why not? Uh, it, I don't think, you know, uh, generally speaking, it, it, it adds cost to the to the project, with the exception of the of the uh, the stage trap system itself. You know, the removable sections and the supports, and that would cost in the neighborhood of twenty thousand dollars, which is real money. I mean, I don't you know want to dismiss that amount, but um, as I say, it's it's. Uh, <clears throat> from from my perspective, it's not essential, but there's an opportunity to do it, and I think some users, uh, not so much the spectacle folks, but you know other users, uh, might find it useful for you know, theatrical productions. It's also something that we can carry in the design mm -hmm. and in the estimates for quite a while uh, until we understand where the overall costs are. Uh, so it's a it's a relatively easy. Exactly. I mean, what it means in, in terms of the building and, and related equipment is, you know, it would probably be something on the order of, of, you know, 12 foot square, 12 by 16, something like that. So there'd be basically an opening in the concrete subfloor of, of that size, and the 20, 000, roughly $20,000 that I talked about is the, the system that, that closes the hole, basically. So there'd be removable sections of the stage uh, to open up a trap. But it's not a mechanical oh, no, no, system. No, no, no. It is, no, no, it's, no, no. Right. I just yeah. want to make sure everybody understood. Yeah. No, it's good it, to it's, it's not a hydraulic lift or something that goes in, up and down right there. Right, right. Yeah. Um, so, again, as Ned said, that's something we can carry um, and think about. We have all, all that space <coughs> that we saw last time in the blocking diagrams. Uh, uh, next, almost kind of related item was a question about a piano lift and you know, whether it, it makes sense to store the piano down in the newly conditioned basement. Um, if 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 we do that, we definitely need a lift to get the piano up and down. Um, and if you pay for a type of lift, you want a lift that does double duty. That's not just large enough for the piano, but can do other things. And the cost for that type of system is significantly more than just the twenty thousand dollars for the trap infill. It's what, could be a hundred. Well, I mean, you know, it's funny, kind of in the same vein of the trap room. You know, we. In, in, in the program, I had said orchestra pit, and I'd said none. But again, looking at the blocking, blocking diagram, it seemed there was an opportunity to have a pit. And, um, and I, I, similar to the trap room, although even more so than the trap room, it would be a nice thing to, to, to have available. Uh, the, the, uh, the pit itself uh, could be designed, and we would recommend designing it uh, to uh, able to add an orchestra lift at a later date should um, you know we not uh, do it uh, right off the bat. Uh, 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 the only reason to have a piano lift would be because we can't store the piano at stage level. I mean the most cost-effective solution to that is to have the, the, the conditioned piano storage at stage level with a, with a route from that storage room on stage. If we can't do that, then yes, you absolutely need a way to get the lift up there. Uh, we've done lots of piano lifts, you know, mainly in concert halls. Uh, but you know, a piano lift, you know, roughly 10 by 10, uh, would be about 150 thousand dollars. So that's 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 really real money. Mm -hmm. But my feeling is, if you're going to spend 150 thousand dollars, spend 250 thousand dollars, and buy yourself an orchestra lift which gives you a means of getting the piano up to stage level, but it also, even if there isn't an orchestra, uh, uh, a musical production or whatever, an opera or whatever that, that needs an orchestra pit, the lift uh, can travel to, to stage level. So it can be a stage extension. We've talked about uh, uh, having a, a recital performances in front of the proscenium, and the lift could, could be part of that system. So, you know, I don't mean to be, you know, to take all these numbers lightly, but if you're, if you're going to spend that much, 
I would say, you know, spend, you know, almost twice as much, you know, again. But it would be it would be a good investment in terms of the life of the building, even if they're, you know, uh, without an orchestra pit. Uh, you know, if you didn't have events with a pit orchestra, it allows you to get stuff from below, a lot of stuff from below on that moving deck, not just the piano. And it gives you an instant way <coughs> to um, create a stage extension. Uh, one thing that we've sort of talked about on the edges is, you know, to, like during the afternoon to have a, uh, a perform, a, you know, a, a, it'd be a set on stage, or you're setting up on stage for some kind of event or performance. But maybe in the afternoon you want to have a speaker at a podium, and if you had a lift, you could bring the stage, the lift up to the stage level, and bring down the house curtain, and accommodate that sort of thing, uh, you know, very easily, much more easily and quickly than you would otherwise. It could the piano lift and trap room be kind of one and the same? Could that piano lift be it sure. come up and, yeah, yeah, and, and use that? In uh, you, you know, that's. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. To save some money, I know it's not the orchestra pit, yeah, but no, that's a good point. at least you have one point. spot doing both. That. Absolutely, sure. absolutely. And it wouldn't preclude, I mean, if as we get in, you know, to the more specific layout of the lower level, I really would, would, would uh, recommend <coughs> creating an orchestra pit if we have the space. Uh, and if we've gone that far, all you, all you need to do is add an extra four feet or so to the pit to allow uh, the introduction of a, of a lift at a, at a later date. And in the meantime, that zone would be filled in by a, by a, by a platform system. Okay. Yeah, I think it, it, we want to be clear, because in terms of the, the design decision-making process, uh, decisions that we can carry out into the future for a while and, and make once you have more financial information versus decisions that need to be made earlier in the process, um, the, the trap room can carry forward. Uh, a, a, an orchestra pit, I think, unmechanized, um, uh, but adding provisions for it, can be carried forward. Um, but a decision to mechanize, mechanize it would have to be made um, relatively soon because of the financial impact. Uh, well, yes and no. I mean, you could, uh, the play, this has happened, we've done a couple of projects, the place is open, uh, we've made the accommodations for adding a lift, and two years later they added the lift, uh, so that's, you know, and I, I mean, in fairness to, to, you know, to our conversation with Spectacle, you know, you, you guys specifically said you're not interested in either a trap room or a, a, a pit, but, you know, for what you're, typically expect to do, but it's more thinking about other users, and it's things that you might take advantage of. You yeah, know, certainly. It's not high on your list. Right. Yeah, that better, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yep. Better one. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, orchestra shell was uh, a comment brought up, and uh, the comment was basically, we don't necessarily need it, given we have an acoustician who's going to design the, uh, the room. And we want to be careful there because, yes, we do have a uh, world-class acoustic acoustician um, on the job. But, um, you know, if, if somebody plays behind the proscenium and there's no shell, that sound energy doesn't, isn't projected out into the house. And, um, you know, a thrust, the next item there, you know, is, is necessary to assemble to, bring, to be able to have an ensemble or, uh, you know, anybody out in front of the proscenium for acoustic reasons, so um, I think, <coughs> Jonah, do you want yeah, or or to weigh in on, <laughs> on this comment and just so that everybody's clear? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, thank you, John, and th thank you all for your, your faith in me. I really appreciate it, but just as John said, <laughs> the, uh, the, de the decision about the show is really programmatic. It's, uh, you know, are we going to have um, unamplified musicians, uh, classical music in particular? Uh, playing uh, behind the proscenium, and if so, then we really need a shell. It's not going to sound good done that way without a shell. Um, and uh, there's nothing I can really do about that beyond, beyond it advising you of that. So the way it seemed to be going at the last meeting that I attended uh, was was that um, the decision that se consensus that seemed to be developing was no, that kind of music would happen uh, out front of the proscenium on, on an extension. Um, under 
understanding that that would limit uh, the, the number of players who could fit just by the dimensions of the extension, and also the, uh, the sight lines from the balcony would be compromised, so that would be for smaller audiences. Um, so that's the way it seemed to be going last time, and that would that would mean you know we don't need a shell. But but again, that's a programmatic decision. How much does a shell cost? About uh, two hundred fifty thousand dollars. And, but we also need to understand that for programming, because the shell requires a tall space adjacent to the stage to be stored. Right. I mean, so in a, it's kind of similar to the uh, to an orchestra lift. You could buy the shell later, but as, as, uh, as we're saying, uh, as part of the building, you would need to build the 25-foot tall tower storage directly off stage mm -hmm. now. So you could defer purchase of the shell, but you'd have to pull the trigger on buying the, uh, the tower storage. And I should to clarify what I said earlier when I was talking about the mechanized element <coughs> of the piano left, because it has the same kind of planning impact. Yes. Not the, oh, sorry, I misspoke when I said the orchestra left. Uh, do you feel as though the, uh, the way, the type of storage that you would need to have off stage for the orchestra the shell could be doubled for other storage? if like we're just not sure? Or is it specific to an orchestra well, shell? Well, you would need it, as soon as you had the shell, you'd need it. Of course. Uh, and, and But if you in, until you bought the shell, it would be a, a roughly 250 foot, square foot footprint okay. to store the towers, but it would be, you know, very yeah, small. You get a double height storage room yeah. Yeah. in the interim, yes. Yeah. Okay. Right. Um, okay. Huh? So that, is one, a decision you know that we would like to um, you know have <coughs> decided uh, definitely by the, before we get to the end of schematic design and you know which ends in, a, in about eight weeks. So, yes, and, and the twenty-five foot storage, how much cost is that? Uh, well, it's, <laughs> I mean, we're going to be building that square footage anyway. It's just a matter of where what you want to use it for and whether or not you. You know, want to reserve that space on the second floor for that. You know, so it begins to kind of carve out of what we can. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, okay. So then the next time was labeling the event space down the basement level gallery, which we've done. So that that's mm -hmm. no problem. Skip the thrust. Oh, I did. Sorry. Um, thrust. So if, if it can be broken down and not permanent, uh, it. Our understanding from the comment is that yes, you would like a demountable thrust uh, stage extension system. Okay. Okay. Now back on track. Uh, number five, gallery event space. We've relabeled that, so that's no problem. We talked about that last time. A nice windowless space down in the basement. Um, the two loading bays was brought up again as a comment. Um, we had two loading bays mentioned in the program. It would be nice if it's possible. As we're looking at the site constraints and issues that there, it's, I think I can safely say that we're likely to end up with just one bay, one loading bay back there. Um, so I, I think you know, moving forward, I expect to see just one loading bay back there. Um, now we are also going to allow for access off of Pearl Street. Um, so, and we had talked about that early on as, as potentially a, a second way to get in, but the primary loading will be off of the, the, the back side and the alley. Um, storage next to stage. Uh, at the, the blocking diagrams we showed last time had both star dressing rooms down at stage level. We talked about uh, taking one of those up to the next floor. That's no problem. We'll see that in our revised blocking diagrams. Um, and sto and there's the storeroom is next to the stage, as is the piano storage currently. Um, egress and access from the back house to Westboro, yes, that's going to happen. That's, there will be emergency egress out of the stair to Pearl Street. And then, as I mentioned, we're looking to make sure there's also an alternate way to get in and out from backstage uh, for a secondary loading entry. Uh, conference room and a, I have a yes. question on that. Mm -hmm. if I don't know if it's possible, but is there any way to make that uh, like a double door uh, access, or is it going to have to be a single door? It could be a, a double wide door, yeah, you know, a two leaf door. Yeah. If it's possible, I mm -hmm. think that would be great. Something that doesn't have the bar in the middle, or a removable bar. Or a removable bar. Yes. Either one. Right. Yeah. 
Um, okay. <laughs> yeah. So if it's gonna if, if it's gonna be a secondary means of loading in and out, then certainly we'd want a, a, a double double door there. Um, there was a comment about conference room and administrative office up together up on the fourth floor. You'll see that um, in the revised blocking diagram. Catering and support and kitchen location was an important comment and realizing again that what the blocking diagrams we showed last time was not a design but um, and we had it shown out you know at the front and we pulled it back as we're developing the blocking diagram you'll see that we do agree that it's important for it to be more centrally located uh, so that it's not far from the loading um, and service access off the alley nor is it far from supporting the catering and uh, other event spaces. Um, the mechanical electrical spaces, there was a question about, well, do we need all of that that was shown and do we need it where it was shown? We're currently kind of working with the mechanical electrical engineers to understand where we're going to need those spaces. Um, but what you saw in the blocking diagram last time was just making sure that we're not um, you know, discounting that. Yeah, and I think the big question was, I mean, obviously you need space. And obviously when it's in the basement, you have stacks and everything yes. that have come all the way through. It's just like the second floor and then the third floor was, I mean, I'm sorry, the first floor seemed to be really large, like twice the size of this room for mechanical. And I know it's just you're trying to fit things in. And then the next floor was even bigger than that. So we're trying to, the basement area you get, and right. as you come up, it should be shrinking and not getting bigger, I would think, but I wasn't sure. Well, we're sure. going to, as, as our mechanical engineers you know, get into the project, we've had a preliminary talk with all the engineers this past right. week. Um, you know, they're going to be looking at the types of systems, and they're going to be giving us guidance on that. So I would, I'm hoping that it's going to shrink. Some sure. of that's going to chop up and be distributed around the building, mm -hmm. not just in one central location, sure. like the diagram showed. So uh, there was a question about a walk-in refrigerator in the basement. Mm -hmm. you know, given the amount of storage space we have down there currently, I don't see why not. You know, it made a lot of sense for uh, the comment about um, you know, storing things for the concessions and for um, catering support. So I, I really don't see why we can't accommodate that in the basement. Uh, production office at stage level, we've shown that in the updated diagram you'll see here in a, just a minute. There was a comment about the lobby and hoping that it can be as open as possible, even considering an open air concept. I think we briefly talked about that last time about maybe having some doors that open out to Main Street. You'll see in the revised um, blocking diagram that we've kind of expanded it across basically the full width of the shoe store on Main Street and have increased the size a little bit as we've made a couple other moves. So we agree that the main, lo the main level lobby should be as open and as large as possible. Um, windows where possible, again, something that we touched on last time, we'll maximize those uh, in the locations that it makes sense. Um, marquee on the corner above the box office, that seemed to be a pretty strong comment. Is that mm -hmm. a strong consensus with the group that that's kind of what you, you all are expecting? Or I mean, we haven't gotten into designing that yet, and we haven't started designing the exterior treatment of the shoe store building. But I just wanted to kind of understand how significant that was to the group, that it be a corner marquee that kind of marks that as opposed to something else. Yes. Trish? I, I, if I'm not mistaken, it was it's more to show like where the box office was, kind okay. of um, like if we had a window on the outside maybe mm -hmm. on Pearl Street where people, so they would know they could buy tickets on the inside, they could buy tickets on the outside. Okay. I think that's... Am I not mistaken? Yeah, I think we talked about we forgetting about, about the. I don't. I think we decided there's not going to be any outside window. Was I oh. think we decided is what we talked no, about last time. No, no. Or is there an outside window? The outside window? There is an outside yeah. window. Okay. More to the point of not blocking the. As I understood it, when the, when this was brought up, it was not dis disrupting the view from Main Street of the people potentially that you could see on the roof deck, mm -hmm. if you will, uh, okay. by having right. a marquee blocking that. So the idea was to push it off onto the corner right. side and something okay. that would be prominent enough that you could see from both from girls both. and me. Right. So that's why it was if you could start developing the idea of a marquee holding the corner mm -hmm. above the box office as just a rough okay. identification yeah. was my understanding mm -hmm. as to how that applies. Okay, we appreciate that. And it would be a great place for selfies up on the deck. Yeah. <laughs> and the challenge is going to be you still have a lot of the pole with a lot of stuff 
utility wise on that same corner poles right there on, on that corner yes, so that's right. something in the conflict pole, of those two things the traffic light yes uh, another comment is i just love to see it wrap around to so if there's something that connects from the marquee across the face of the building on main street mm -hmm. not necessarily the same height or width or anything yeah. mm -hmm. but some sort of continual element i think okay would Great. be nice okay thank you we appreciate it um Next item is banquet tables, and uh, we have a, a diagram we can we'll show you um, where we're getting close to 300 seats uh, with, on the floor and stage combined, and that's with a fairly uh, liberal uh, layout without being too crowded. So um, we'll we'll show you that in a minute. Um, chairs and tables uh, preferences to own them and provide storage. Yes. Again, we have a lot of storage, and the purchase of those is. Certainly, you know, a decision you all will make, and we'll make sure that we accommodate that uh, storage. And we can kind of identify sp specific table chair storage as opposed to just being um, the large open area that we have now. Uh, the parterre level uh, that we talked about last time, um, the comment was can that be uh, loose seating instead of fixed seating? Do we think about a drink rail there? Um, kind of very multifunctional space along the parterre and possible ADA seating <coughs> there. Um, I, I think certainly, you know, if if we end up with a, a flat kind of gallery down the sides that is, is the parterre, then, um, you know, if it's loose seating, then we start to uh, also have to deal with the height of the railing from a code perspective because when we're designing with fixed seats, in a theater, the code allows our rails in front of the seats to be down as low as like 26, 28 inches for sight lines and because people aren't standing next to the rail at that point because there's fixed seating. So people carefully walk in front to their seats. When you have loose seating in a balcony condition so that you can have um, more cabaret tables, um, you can have um, standing you know, general admission standing room along the balcony edge and things like that, then we have to start um, designing for a 42-inch guardrail system. And that 42 inches is right about here as you're sitting down. And, um, you know, so that gets in the way of sight lines. Now, there are systems that have adjustable rails. Um, you know, that's, that's a cost, but it is an option. Um, and it's something that we would have to talk through with the local code officials. Um, Pete, do you all have any thoughts or comments about kind of uh, loose seating up on the on, on the balcony level on the side galleries? Or? Yeah, I think from last week's discussion of just the idea of if possible to, that that might add some flexibility or mm -hmm. a little bit of a different vibe for certain types of events. So if anything's ever done in the round, it might be <coughs> that could be seats would be positioned. And also, whether or not choosing an option in that direction would um, impact capacity. <coughs> okay. I mean, is flexibility and kind of yes. Yeah. I, I, maybe I'm not remembering correctly, but wasn't the, the part here was also to help with um, alleviate some of the lobby congestion. They could do like cocktail or something. Like that. <coughs> they could have a standalone bar or well, there, there's you know, the there's the promenade, which is a, we call it the second right. level right. lobby space, okay. and then the parterre. Which <coughs> is okay. These are really really strong. They are. All right. Um, Thank you. Yeah. So so the parterre was at the top of the um, telescopic seating and it was in a, a U shape and we'll right. see it again in the diagram. Right, that was the, the one that and went, it went around the, down yeah. the, yeah. the And I thought that sides. was open and looked down yeah. towards the, the lobby area. Is that part of where it would be open also? And well, no, so that's that's the promenade, second floor problem. lobby. Okay. The, the parterre is in the house okay, I see looking the, at the stage. Okay. And I'll, we'll, we'll look at it in the diagram and talk about it again. Okay. Um, the, the balcony level, there was a question about wraparound seating, possibly at the balcony level. Um, we're looking at that, and I'll show you some um, studies that we've done about that. 
love to hear your opinion on that. Yeah, we, th we think it's a, a great idea um, to be able to kind of bring the seating around at the up balcony level, not just at the parterre level. Um, so we'll, we'll show you what we're studying about cool. that. That certainly helps create more of a, a theater type environment, you know, for the center as opposed to just a multi-functional event space. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm interested to learn about in that regard of, you know, what's the balance of having, uh, you know, obstructed versus unobstructed view within that format. Mm -hmm. um, but by having wraparound seating, mean there'd be less overhang, so the acoustics would be better for the people who are on the orchestra level, who like otherwise would be under the balcony overhang. Um, like those are the kind of things I'd love to learn about. Okay, and um, well, and we're going to be studying all of that as okay. as we look at these. So. Uh, the next item was a uh, rooftop terrace. I think we agree at the last meeting. If we can do that, that uh, would be a wonderful. Um, Thing to have here. Um, again, we're, we're keeping it in mind. We can kind of not decide on that quite yet, but we can continue to plan for it and see if we can make it happen. And um, as we look at the shape of the house and the design of the house, um, we might be able to find some extra space up at that level to be able to sneak in a unisex restroom or something like that and a, a little bar area. Because, you know, all of those types of functions are really necessary at that level if you're going to have a successful rooftop terrace. So, um, and then there was a question about is there an accessible route from the front of house to the back of house that doesn't go through the audience chamber? We are expecting to plan one um, and so that that can happen. Um, and you'll start to see that develop as we get further into the design. So these were the mm -hmm. list of comments. We just wanted to make sure you all were aware that we heard them. We're addressing them as we move forward in the designs. And um, so I'll quickly kind of run through some of the updates then to the blocking diagram and um, it kind of follows a lot of you know, the comments that we um, just went through. So here in the basement level, um, really, you know, we just relabeled the event room as, as gallery as well. We are showing a trap room now underneath the stage. This one is at 600 square feet with separate general storage spaces to the side of that if it wants to, if we want to divide that up. Um, we had the green room downstairs. We kept that. We moved the te technical supervisor office next to the green room. We still have restrooms down there as well for people who come. Um, and we've moved a communal dressing room down into the basement based on what we talked about last time because we wanted we had that up higher in the back of house last time we wanted to be able to free up some space for more multifunctional spaces up there so and we took the crew the crew and locker room and put that up um, on another level because that didn't need to be down near the green room so um, here you get at least you know one group of, of um, actors that, or you know, performers down um, near the green room I don't know if, I mean, if you all have any comments about kind of this specific yeah, I mean, arrangement. I, get, it's I think the, the crew spends the least amount of time in the green room. Yeah. So spending, sending them up and having one down is good. Plus, sometimes we bring in some smaller acts that are only three or four people. They would like just having that one dressing room downstairs next to the green room so they don't travel as much. Yep, we're still showing the area below the audience chamber is, is pretty wide open right now, and everybody seemed to think that, you know, if we can keep it that way, that'd be great. Yes? If you did the orchestra pit option sometime mm -hmm. in the future, where would that That appear? would be, sorry, uh, right here, just car carving a little bit out of that um, bit of space. Uh, one thing I want to note is that in uh, this revised, blocking diagram. We're showing the elevator and stair in the back of the house in a small addition out in the alley. And we want to consider that because it frees up some of the space in the back of the house, um, and especially when we get up to the upper levels, for really, you know, better access from front of house to back of house. Um, we're not, you know, this would have to go up to the four stories, the same height as the apartment building, 
but the back of the surf is right here, so we're not, you know, Im impacting the snow drift issue on the on their rooftop. Um, and uh, so, you know, we really like to continue to consider that small small addition, which is really just the stair and elevator in the alley. So, um, and again, we've got. Uh, large women's room down here and men's room. In the program, we had a 1,000 square feet for um, the women's room. So we have half of that down here at the basement level. We had 450 square feet for men's room. We've got 250, so a little bit over half. And we, we had those in the basement before, but um, we also had them at the main level. And we've taken them out of the main level and thinking that, well, we've got at least half down in the basement, you know, just one floor down from the main level. You'll see we also have the other half at the second level. So by not having major group restrooms on the main floor, we freed up space for what might be VIP, VIP lounge. Um, and, and we've also been able to enlarge the area for the lobby. And um, so what I wanted to understand is, is your group good with the idea of the main restrooms either one floor down or one floor up from the main level? Um, yes. I think as long as there's ADA access, there, yes, yeah, there will always be. get to that. They've got the elevator that we're expecting there, yes. Yes. I agree. I think using the space on the first level for as much of that mm -hmm. that we can. I'm okay with going upstairs or downstairs okay. to use a, a restroom. I think that I've done that in other theaters. Once people know where they are, yeah, it, I, I think it, it yeah. doesn't tend to be a problem. I just want to make sure that the group was good. Yes. I will say from a patron relations standpoint, yes. if any free room opens itself up, it would be nice to have even just one unisex ADA bathroom on that main level. Okay. If the opportunity arises itself. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I, I appreciate rethinking that. Um, I, I strongly feel there needs to be accessible restrooms on every floor. On every floor, okay. I do. I, it doesn't have to be the full bulk mm -hmm. of restrooms, um, but I, I think it'd be unwise to not do that from a, from a patron perspective, particularly with ADs in mind, but really anyone. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you, it's not just going to be folks who have physical limitations, like a wheelchair using, like that would be hindered by having to use the elevator to use the restroom. It would be older folks with mobility issues mm -hmm. or anyone with any kind of mobility issue. And um, I think that could greatly reduce like the flow of an event. It could slow down an intermission. It could. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I think that it's possible that the VIP lounge uh, could also be part of the gallery or be the mm -hmm. gallery for a particular <coughs> event. It doesn't basement, necessarily yeah. have to be uh, its own separate space, even though some days it could be branded as such. Okay, right. And that might open up more space for uh, additional restrooms, even if they're not the main functioning mm -hmm. restrooms. Yeah, doing, yeah, having the space downstairs in the basement do triple duty, um, you know, as maybe a potential VIP spot or as, as we get to see um, kind of upstairs in the back of house there are other multi-purpose spaces I mean one of those could be deemed the VIP lounge yes well and I agree with everybody but it'd be nice to have some up on the on the first floor on, on every floor but I know that when we were at the Harvard theater we had to go down a set of stairs or an elevator for that one and I know at the um, um, the palace you have to go out of the theater or upstairs to get in the bathrooms. And while I don't like it necessarily, um, it still does accommodate if we wanted space like this. But it would be nice to at least have something small, whether it's um, a unisex handicap or mm -hmm. something like that. Right. Um, so, so it doesn't have to be the large group restroom on this floor, but to accommodate a few folks would be ideal. Right. No, I will agree to disagree. On no, no. That. Well. <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> Okay. <laughs> yeah. I don't see the need for having the VIP lounge on the first floor. And it, like, it, just from my experience, kind of the anticipation is the reward when you go to a VIP lounge. So walking in the door and taking a hard left, you know, I kind of like the idea of it being somewhere where it's like a journey to get to. You know what I'm saying? And then that's that's 
very valuable space mm -hmm. where, you, where you could put bathrooms, which I think would be a better purpose or something, okay. you know. That's right. just my opinion. Well, no, no, that's, that's why we modified the diagram so that we could hear <coughs> people's reactions and understand. And, and I think I agree. I, I mean, I think first floor is obviously nice for bathroom, but yeah, I, I haven't been in many theaters as some of you, but I've been like a lot of the theaters in Boston. You're going downstairs every time you go to the bathroom. So I don't think it's impossible, but I agree. The green room is a place you're going to go to, and if you go down there, it's easier to go down there than worrying about the bathroom. I'd rather have the bathrooms on the first floor in the green room in the basement than the office. Yeah. Okay. VIP. VIP, yes. rather, sorry. Well, the, most of these theaters that we're citing where you have to go up or down are older theaters. I agree. Mm -hmm. I agree. And, yeah, they're working it in. Um, I think it could raise questions the day it opens and someone goes in and says, we paid $15 million right. and we don't have a bathroom on the first floor. <laughs> I agree. That's what I'm afraid of. Because it's okay. the first thing people yeah. complain about. One yeah. of many bathrooms. All right. But, like, ha I've gone to the, the palace many times and been like, oh, do you outside go to the bathroom? <laughs> Yeah, well, we're definitely not sending people out. Well, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Okay, but yeah, these are all very good points. Did you have yeah, I think wherever the VIP lodge, whatever lands, <laughs> right. it should be close to a bathroom because oh, absolutely. My, my family and I went to the Theater um, Mogador in Paris mm -hmm. as the VIP package, and during the intermission when they treat you all wonderful down there, I had to go to the bathroom, and our escort said, Oh, no, no, you don't want to go to the bathroom. The lines are too long. Mm -hmm. Even in that place, they whisked me out back oh, to okay. another bathroom yeah. where I didn't have to wait. So I think it's very important that wherever you have the VIP lounge, it's we have easy access. We have adjacent restrooms, yes. Right. Okay. Yes, yeah. question about the, the box office space. Yeah. Um, to do the windows with enough space to, for the lines to queue properly and also to have a separate space in there that could be a box office manager's <coughs> office. Yeah. Is there a possibility to expand that beyond the 175? You know, there's a lot of cash controls that need to be in place and security. Mm -hmm. So having just an open box office with a safe in the corner, yeah. it, it's nice to have a separate office with a box office manager with some security to it. And it just seems like 175 square feet to have accommodate a number of windows plus a separate yeah. secure. Well, office we had in the previous diagram we had separate spaces mm -hmm. and um, there was an office and um, a, a box there was a manager's office and a box right, office yeah. space and those were sized for three windows in the box office space so all we did here was kind of combine them and yeah it, and when it's designed the manager definitely needs to close okay to close their door and count the money uh, securely yeah, yeah, okay, I didn't know because like, like you said, right. the other one was separated. I just didn't know if that yeah, was Yeah, and before different. we had concessions down here, we just yeah. kind of have moved it around. Yeah. Um, but you have to have queuing and, you know, for roll call and everything like that. So as it gets designed, those will all be considerations. Um, back of house, you know, we're still showing piano storage. We're still showing star dressing room one on this level. Uh, we all agreed that, that was important. We brought the production office up from the basement. We still have loading back in the corner mm -hmm. and stage security. And you, here we have 200 square feet of storage directly off the stage. If that needed to grow to 250 square feet because of the shell, we have room to do that. But you can see here where this little addition and pulling the elevator and stair out kind of begins to really show how much more easily we can get circulation from front of house to back of house because we're wanting to maintain that 60 foot width for the stage. Yes. I'd just like to, as an aside, I love that idea, and I think it's one of the reasons why we decided to go with you guys, because mm -hmm. that, that out-of-the-box thinking, mm -hmm. I really appreciate that. I don't know if it's going to last, if we're really gonna, but I think it's great. <laughs> For right now. For right now. On that right. picture, it looks it's fantastic. Working. Okay, excellent. Uh, any questions on, on this level? Yes. Uh, I, I would like to, I don't know how, but I think I would like to see concessions and catering support abutting each other so that they can access what they need to access in yes. terms of, of food. Yeah. Uh, we will try, definitely be trying to do that. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it's possible, but... There are strong benefits to doing it that way. So as we get into you know, real design here very soon, yeah. um, we'll try to make that a reality. And my other suggestion is if we're considering a walk-in fridge in mm -hmm. the basement, yes. um, making that underneath 
I guess, this area. So that it's not back here and then you have to travel up. Yeah, I mean, there's two the sides to that, yeah. is that there's no elevator really in that area for load in from the basement. Like, if you're, if you're having a walk-in, you're going to put, like, drinks and kegs and whatever yeah. in there. So I feel like it would be kind of a long haul to get up, and I don't know if there's a way to tr transition that more smoothly. Okay. I don't know. All right. And I guess I had a question as far as it, at first I agreed, and, I, and maybe I still do, is really concessions and catering really two totally separate things, though, or no? Yeah. I mean, yeah. concessions are concessions I mean, on the night of a performance. Catering, I look at as if you're having the, the chamber event, and that's nothing to do with concessions, yeah. but am I wrong? They do you speak to that. Yeah, they often mm -hmm. run kind of parallel and but separate, right? So the concessions operated for a show um, would more than likely not be using the catering uh, kitchen on a, on a show like that's more self-contained at the interview station. Whereas the catering support station for an event that's catered will obviously be used there, or uh, catering for artists, catering, that type of thing, so back of house catering. Uh, I would anticipate that being used more, more so. Or for VIP events. Going Correct, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the, the for the most part, the concessions operation is for the, the, the need of, of speed and efficiency for the windows of time you have, it, it really needs to be fairly self-contained and, and, and self-supporting uh, uh, wherever it's located. With lots of room for queues. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. Exactly. Right. Right. Fast yeah. lines. You got On the other end of that, um, putting the concessions right in front of the box office from a staffing perspective might be handy, but then that would limit our ability to have any box office windows on the inside. Is no. that correct? Well, that's right. And again, this isn't meant to be a design. We're just kind of looking at concessions, you know, in floating in different places. Yeah. But absolutely, we have to have queuing space uh, for box office windows on the inside and as well as the outside. Um, so if we're going to have windows in, in both outside and inside, um, I don't know. I guess it doesn't work for, 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 for Pete, but if the 175 is enough, I feel like inside there it might be very tight, but I don't know. As we, as we start to lay it out, yeah. we'll confirm all of that, okay. and as we start to design the shape of the house in more detail, you know, that stair is likely to kind of pull and shift and open okay. up some space on that corner, so. Okay. Um, all right, well, we'll move on to the next floor then. Mm -hmm. The, uh, well, sorry, before we do that, I want to show you the diagram. Um, these are 60-inch round banquet tables with eight seats. I know last time you all said sometimes you squeeze yeah. 10 people. <laughs> but just, again, uh, being very conservative, uh, we were able to fit uh, 24 of those uh, size tables in here. This bar right here is the uh, where the telescopic seating is stored and kind of stacked up in the back of the room. And so you, uh, we end up with uh, 45 or 50 feet, depending on kind of the design of the apron of the stage, uh, between the telescopic seating storage and the front of the stage. So um, again, depending on what the event is, you know, if you have um, head tables or something like that, we, you know, could easily get 24 60-inch <coughs> rounds. So that's 192 seats we're showing in this configuration on the main floor. And then up on stage, we really kind of expect to see the tables only, you know, not in the wing space, but just on the main stage space. So 10 of those up there is 80. So combined, you're looking at 272. If you squeeze them um, right now, they're laid out so that there's 30 inches between the backs of the seats with people in the seats. Now, if you compress that a little bit or you want to add a couple more tables in your, you know, total counts, up around the range, I think you were saying you wanted to be last time. So, any questions about? No, looks good. Okay. All right. Good. So the second level that has the parterre uh, that wraps around um, at this level, that diagram is still the same as we had last time. Um, I do want to point out one thing that's going to be a change as we look at the design of the house in section, and that is, you know, if, if you have seats in the parterre all the way down here, well, their views are greatly restricted. So when we, as we're starting to look at the design of the house, 
we're pulling that back so that uh, we don't lose those seats. And that goes for some of these seats on the very ends of the um, telescopic seating where really there would be four foot aisles on the very end. So uh, when we're looking at sight lines and plan, we take the center line of the back wall of the stage and draw that line out through the proscenium opening and then kind of that establishes the you know, optimal sight lines for the, the patrons. Yeah, we're, looking, we're looking for at minimum <coughs> someone sitting nearest the stage or wherever to see uh, at least two thirds of a sight of stage. <coughs> uh, and and if you're, it's true that if, the, if, you know with the parterre going all the way to the proscenium, you don't want to. No one would want to sit there. But I would maybe we'll get into it with the diagrams. So we would still continue it because it's useful as a technical access. gallery, right? Well, so. just access. Yeah. 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 So there are those design considerations that we're working through in schematic design, and you'll see it develop. Um, so. Because we moved um, some of the dressing rooms around, um, we brought the star dressing room number two up to this level. And um, the loading space is double height. What's not shown here is that if this is orchestra <coughs> storage below, then this is going to be orchestra, you know, that will be carved out of this level here. But again, you can see pulling the elevator and stair out really <coughs> frees up uh, opportunities for circulation there. And uh, this is that second 500 square foot women's room and another 250 square foot men's room at this level. We modified the area we had shown before as far as the, part, the promenade uh, lobby space uh, on the parterre level and so we're looking at about if we carve out some space for double height lobby there on Main Street. We're still looking in this diagram at about 1300 square feet of, of we'll call it you know, second level lobby. Um, here. You add that to the almost 1,900 square feet we're now showing down below, we're getting close to that you know, um, total that is in the program. So we've, we're, we're, we're finding some extra space um, to free up the, the lobby experience for everybody. Uh, those were, well, in what you see here also is that um, we, are, we have some unprogrammed areas that, that will you know, be good and we can find uses for as we move forward. Yeah. On the, the last one, and I know this is just blocking, you would put in like a drummer rec room and an AV rec room. Is that something We've that moved that up, moved it up okay. a little bit higher to be kind of more efficient in the way it gets um, laid out um, with the conduits and things like that. So we've moved that up to be a little bit more efficient in uh, our thinking there. And so this is the balcony level. So the third level, um, we haven't checked, modified the balcony yet, even though we're looking at carrying some of the, uh, the arms around on the sides. You'll see that uh, in our studies here shortly. But um, this is where the roof terrace is. Last time we had shown the roof terrace only coming down to here, so it does make sense to just pull it on to the edge. There, I think it was a question about, well, why don't you wrap the roof terrace all the way around if we're not building next to the surf property line. Well, this is a location where the mechanical engineer would really love to put some rooftop equipment. And so we're kind of reserving that space for them to tell us what they need to put up there. Well, I also think your view is over Main Street, not looking at and the top know, of the building. And you know, who wants to look at the top of the adjacent building, right? Um, so that, that's why we're only showing kind of the roof terrace out front. If, if we can get it, if that's 1,400 square feet. Um, right there, so that's that's good size. That's uh, what? How many? What's like the capacity for that? Per um, number of people. You could get uh, 150 people up there. Mm -hmm. um, we have to make sure we have egress for that many people. And um, now you can see here that we really don't show any space for a restroom or a, a, a bar right now. But again, um, as we start to design the shape of the the house. <coughs> You know, some of this might pull in and we can find some extra space in the corner. But even that rooftop space, we say you don't want to use it as you wrap around rather than looking at a building right there. Yeah. Well, you don't, you don't need the view for a bar or a restaurant. No, we don't, but we also can't, we don't want to build up in, right in this I'll location. I'll say building up. Okay. Against that property line. For that where we start snow load. Build snow load on, okay. the, on the surf, yes. Can you go down West Pearl Street? 
Just, I mean, it'd be narrow, but... No, because you'll see that the, the, um, the volume of the house actually, right now, is on that Pearl Street okay. wall. Oh. Yeah, so um, that's something we'll talk about. Now, we brought the dimmer rack and the AV room, rack room, up to this level, um, because a lot of the distribution from those rooms happens up high, and so if they're up higher, then down on the second floor is just less conduit we have to buy and more economical distribution. And if we decide, um, you know, we're going to have the technical subcommittee meetings, and if it's decided uh, that we can afford and desire LED lighting system, then those two rooms can actually be next to each other. But right now we're still planning for uh, you know, having them separated if need, need be. We were getting some preliminary input from the mechanical engineer that was pushing us toward LED mm -hmm. because of the heat produced by conventional lights and it would actually impact the sizing of their systems. Yes, he, he did talk about that the other day when we were speaking. Um, right, so if you go with LED, it doesn't put off as much heat as the conventional um, lights. You know, not that we use incandescents, but um, the more heat you put off, the larger your cooling, your HVAC system needs to be to keep it cool. So they're, you know, while the LED lighting system might be have a first cost that's higher than the more conventional lighting system, you, know, you also have to factor in, and the engineers will be looking at this, life cycle costs of the mechanical system. And you know, a smaller, more efficient mechanical system is likely to save you operational costs over the years, and so you, know, you look at that, that return on investment uh, between those systems. Uh, yeah, we, we, it was very early days. Uh, there are other aspects of the lighting that have nothing to do with heat load mechanical, so yes. we need to get into all the different... All the technical yeah. Yeah. discussions, it, you know, it, it's a broad impact, so. It is not just the simple <laughs> one or the other. Yeah, that's right. Um, so up on the third level, we brought up the second communal dressing room. Um, and uh, we've got it a multi-purpose space at this level. And we've got the cruise lockers here on the third level. Um, again, those can kind of maybe trade second to third floor as we develop the design. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's, again, plenty of space that we're finding back there in the back of the existing uh, apartment building. And then the, the fourth floor, uh, again, we left the venue admin office here. A um, couple of restrooms at this level, and um, <coughs> calling this conference a multi-purpose room. So, you know, you've got another multi-purpose room right below that. Both of them on the corner of the building there. Nice views there too. Mm -hmm. with those windows. So, uh, the windows are going to be great for all the spaces yeah. uh, in the back of the house. Any questions? Yes. Uh, this may be because it's not a block, but what level would a catwalk be built at? This level. <coughs> Well, be high. Oh, be I, high we'd have to. Right? We'd look at it in a section. Yeah, well, you'll see it in the section yeah. where cool. we just schematically are showing it. Cool. It shows up. Catwalk and fall spot. Yes. yes. Right. That's all I hear. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> we are thinking about it, and it'll show up. All right. Any questions with regard to the blocking diagrams? With the few changes we made, I think, I hope that we have reflected, um, you know, kind of changes that you commented on and, and we're kind of really honing in on things. Okay, next slide. Yes, sir. I just have one comment that from a layout perspective. As you look at your concessions area and mm -hmm. kitchen equipment or anything in relation to your um, rooftop balcony, remember there's clearance requirements for any ventilation and exhaust systems yes. on kitchen equipment. So that, that may play into with that. When we start to take those up through the roof, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So yeah. That's a good point. Okay. All right. Um, so just quickly to kind of move in in a, a very brief segment here about, um, you know, as we're getting more information about the site, this is a copy of the preliminary survey that was provided. Um, so it's given us uh, exact dimensions around the building. We're looking at the utilities that are coming in from the back side. Um, we've got now spot elevations at the entry doors. Um, which you know, allows us to confirm information 
uh, that we've taken, you know, or the existing condition measurements that we've taken on the existing buildings. We now have to kind of, um, you know, correlate all this information. And um, what we're really kind of focusing in on here with the survey and information is what's happening back there in the alley, which you all are aware of. Mm -hmm. You know, it has the spaghetti that's back there. And um, it's my understanding that, correct me if I'm wrong, but there is, the utility company is looking at uh, possibly dealing with these pole-mounted transformers in a yeah. way that would benefit us. Harvey and our, our um, engineers have met, electrical engineers have met, and, and they are <coughs> looking at the can't, can't do cans. The load's too big electrically, so we need to find a location for a pad-mounted transformer somewhere. But, but that would enable us to kind of clear up some yeah. of that. Yeah. yeah. Then what they would do is they'd pull everything back to about where Overshawn was, uh, the next pole, and then they'd come in underground. Uh, the spaghetti that you see is... It's more than just I gotta, power. I gotta get a hold of the consolidator and find out how much of that is still alive and how much of it is dead. <laughs> I think it's been years of renovations over the time. But there is a three, there's a, also a three phase line it comes down the alleyway, crosses West Pearl, and heads down another alleyway. Uh, that's the, that's after the three-phase power. So they they were going to go back. They were supposed to go back and look and see what they have on this side and all those services. So there's been discussions. They know the preference is to get rid of all of that. Uh, we'll see where it goes. All right. Um, so what we haven't sketched in here is that little addition that comes in um, right there, but. With, with that addition, we still have enough uh, width here on the this back side to be considering a loading door right here. What we're also thinking about is possibly a loading door here off pedestrian alley um, and a way that trucks wouldn't necessarily pull onto the pedestrian alley, but that we would facilitate loading kind of directly in to the side there. And that we might have to um, strongly considered because when we look at the civil engineer starts looking at the turning radius for backing trucks in and clearances and things like that we don't want to say well it absolutely has to be here we want to still you know, have two options to be considering because there are a lot of constraints back there and we're just going to have to work through them I just wanted to let you all understand that keep in mind you're going to need at least an 8 by 8 area uh, for that transport Right. Yeah. So, so that's so gonna that's gonna chew up some of that space with that addition. Mm -hmm. That transformer is Q service one. Oh. Just the load out there. The load's too big to do it with the full mount transformers I can see with. Okay. Does it have to be on the ground? Can it be on the roof? It has to be on the ground. We don't want to do that. Yeah. No, we don't want to put it in the roof. <laughs> yeah. And we don't want it it's in the extremely building, so. expensive. It can be done. Yeah. I mean, the other option is, I mean, before we put it on the ground, we're putting it on a pole. Yeah. Yeah. That's another one. It's a more costly way of doing it, but it's less than putting it on the wall. So this is, this is just to inform you all of the information mm -hmm. that we're gathering. Mm -hmm. Once we need a decision, we'll come to you with all the appropriate information. And give you all yeah, I just I'd like to keep everybody informed about exactly what we're looking at, and so that when we do come to you for a decision, you understand that we've been doing our homework, and there are reasons why what we're showing you um, happens. And this is just real quick to show you that we've taken, you know, this goes back to our original diagram with the the shoe store and the apartment building. This is that little addition we're thinking about. We've overlaid the plan from the existing building and started looking at the, the columns here in the apartment oh, yeah. building and how those relate to the size of the stage that we're um, ideally uh, going to be designing with. You know, we're looking at a 35 foot deep stage by 60 feet wide, so we wanted to understand where that kind of lays in in relation to the existing column grid that's there. And you can see this red dashed line here is the first column grid off of the exterior wall um, on the pedestrian alley side. The next column grid is closer in, um, and so we have started a conversation with the structural engineer to assess 
what is most economical in terms of keeping, you know, how much of the structure can we even think about that? Is it more economical to take it all out? Um, so we're in that discussion now. Right now, what we're kind of all on the same page about is if we can keep um, the perimeter of the existing uh, columns and floor system and, and insert our steel frame within that, uh, then would probably be more economical than taking everything out um, in the apartment building. And so we were looking at, well, if we kind of demolish back to that column line, that opens up 42 feet there. We don't necessarily want to get a deeper stage because then that starts to really impinge on how we program that back of house behind the stage. So the 30 foot stage depth, uh, which is here, I'm oh, sorry, 35 foot stage depth that we're designing to, you know, is, is off of that. And you kind of envision our crossover corridor and the corridors above between our new back of stage wall and that existing grid line. So it seems to be working out pretty nicely um, within the apartment building and its structure. So um, I think we're happy with how that's going. Yeah, I think so. They, they, they want to maintain basically a single bay of existing inside of the, the envelope of both of both buildings and that works in the in the apartment building. In the apartment <coughs> building, yeah. It in the shoe store, given how large the house is in comparison to the footprint, you know, we're gonna be taking out you know the, the second floor and then we need to take out the roof because all that has to come up and the floor structure at ground level here is just not designed. So we're gonna really need to think about taking all the floors out within the, the shoe store and, and building up. And I think so again the, the strategy and this is early days that they're describing uh, is that they need to keep the new structure away from the existing foundations. Uh, so the, the new construction would happen at a, a distance determined really by our planning. And preliminarily, they're suggesting that the exterior walls are torn down to the foundation and we construct new exterior walls off the foundation. So we avoid the major expense of demolishing the foundations. Um, uh, we, we don't need to underpin them or anything because our new structure is well inside that. Uh, but as, as of today, uh, that's that's the <laughs> that's the thinking. That's their uh, thinking. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. the good the, the the costs that we talked about briefly, I think last time that were quite significant, were for the demolition and replacement of the building found, existing building foundations, and it appears we can work, work with those. Um, that's great. And still provide the the audience chamber that we're talking about. And then we got information floor to floor heights uh, and roof heights for the building. So just one thing to note is that uh, according to our information and the way we've modeled the building in, in the computer now is that the roof, the existing roof of the apartment building is just under four, 54 feet off of the main floor. And that'll come into play as we talk about looking at this in section here in just a minute. Any questions? Okay. So this is, again, very early in our design process as we're moving from programming into schematic design. And you know, we're going to be working through schematic design for the next eight weeks here. So what you are starting to see are very preliminary graphics that come out of the uh, 3D modeling we have in the computer. As we get further mm -hmm. into this process, the graphics will get a little bit more robust and more detailed. We're just now starting to look at kind of the architecture of the house and, and the structure and space and uh, of the stage house and things like that. Um, what this shows you is a section cut through the building uh, looking from Pearl Street into the building. Uh, you know, this is, this is the house with the telescopic seating platforms. We're not showing the seating yet. We'll start getting that in. It, 
When we put in all the seats, that starts to slow down our computers a little bit. So um, we wait to put that in as after we've gotten a little bit further. But so here's the telescopic seating pulled out. You can see um, the aisle there on the edge. This is the parterre and starting to wrap around, but where we pulled it back. Um, but as Joe said, there are reasons for continuing access on, you know, for technical reasons. These are the catwalk locations. Um, the you know, follow spot would be back on the rear, rear catwalk. And uh, so control room back here, and then the, the raked balcony seating. And in this illustration uh, and study, what we're looking at is everything just kind of straight rows, taking the balcony straight across, not looking yet at carrying balcony seating ar around the, the edges. Um, you might wonder why in the stage we're still showing the floors of the apartment building, but this was just to illustrate that you know, we were looking at the structural bays in there and understanding where this back wall was occurring. We would definitely take out the flooring there so that we have a, the stage height that we need. Um, and then this is the cross corridor uh, at, at stage level and then the access corridors above and you start to see these spaces that we are programming on the back side. What this also starts to show us is that um, if we're going to build the stage up a couple of feet from the existing floor level, whether that's three feet or four feet, we're, we have to talk about that. Three or less. <laughs> Joe likes three or less. We like three to four feet for other reasons. Um, so we, that's a discussion and working we have to do. Um, but so, you know, like I said, 54 feet basically from the existing floor up to the existing roof. And what we've modeled here is from the stage up to this line is, is the grid level. And then above the grid level, um, you need access, technical access. And then about seven feet is ideal so that people can walk around on the grid above um, all the battens where the, um, yeah, everything's flown by, uh, off of. <coughs> <laughs> and then you've got steel above that. So, you know, you could easily have 10 feet necessary above grid level. So that starts to uh, ask a question about, well, how tall does this need to be? Do we go up above that existing apartment roof, building roof? Um, and we think that that is something that we're, well, we have to study a little bit further, but we're going to probably recommend that we do that, um, A, so that we get the grid height that we need, which if we had to live with 45 feet, maybe, but it's, it's not true. ideal. Yeah. Uh, because, so if grid's at 45, then you add the 10, now you're at 55, so you're bumping up a little bit. A more ideal grid height would be closer to 50. Yeah, um, that was sort of the minimum, yeah. yeah so, so well, as we're saying, it's, all this is very early days, I mean, Part of the structural discussion that we haven't talked about yet is it's not like if we kept the existing roof, we can't. There's still, yeah, I mean, yes. there's still all this new steel mm -hmm. that has to span. Yes. So you're basically, I think, at the end of the day, you're you're peeling that roof off right. anyway. So and I think part of the exercise is, you know, then you're. You then know, why not? If we're peeling off the part of the stage, why don't we just come yeah. up a little bit? And yeah. Jonah, I'm not sure if he's still on the line or not, but. He's going to tell us he wants probably six inches of concrete on that stage house roof for acoustics, right? We don't want to hear the rain on the stage house roof during a performance and things like that. So you know, we've got all the structure to hang the rigging and everything, and you know, we need properly design it the house shell for acoustics. So we're likely well, to be. Thank you. <laughs> <What's that? laughs> well said. <laughs> thank you, Jonah. Glad you're still there. Um, so we're more likely than not going to be um, proposing that the stage house pop up above that existing apartment building roof. And, and the incremental cost of that, um, and I'm usually a bit of a cost pessimist on the project, I'm very optimistic about what we can do from, with design, but the mm -hmm. costs are always a challenge. Mm -hmm. The incremental cost of that is minor, though. Yeah. The, the vast majority of the cost is in the, in the internal vertical structure. You're paying for the roof anyway. Um, so, you know, it's, it's really to your benefit to 
follow Joe's advice. Yeah, so we're saying 50. Always. And because we also don't want to be restricting what Pete can book into the space. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're thinking about that as well. Um, all right, so then for the house, you can see, you know, we're bumping up. This is the existing roof level of the shoe store. So this is the volume of the, the section of the house that is going to pop up. And, you know, we're, here's that kind of 15-foot deep roof terrace there. Now, the model still shows the front of the existing shoe store, which we're not expecting to keep. And as Ned said, we're looking at, um, you know, as we get around Pearl Street in the front, taking that down and then building up off of it. Uh, because we're, you can see how much of the roof and how much of the second floor really has to come out of the shoe store building for this to happen. And then even this floor level, you know, in its current condition, as we've said before, is just not properly structured for this type of use. So that would have to be rebuilt. So, um, you know, what didn't show in the block <coughs> diagrams is the apron that, you know, would be, it's going to be designed out in front of the proscenium wall and kind of the design of the front of the stage. All that will be worked out. Um, so again, thinking about straight seating configuration, kind of straight rows, and a uh, kind of a straight gallery along the parterre level on the sides is really in line with some of the images that we shared with you last time when we were um, looking about expectations. I think some of the theaters that you probably have visited with really kind of a, a very orthogonal and rectangular room. Um, you know, telescopic seating, some of them have loose seating, and uh, so that's when you start to think about the architecture of the space, which is what we're re really starting to try to get into, this is kind of what you would end up with. Now, something that we want you to consider is thinking about it more um, as, as, a, as a theater type space. Um, I think, you know, we've, we've said that there are telescopic seating manufacturers that can offer a curve uh, in plan. And so we look at taking that and expressing that in the balcony level as well. So we start to bring, you know, people around a little bit, uh, perhaps for a more intimate feel than what you have with just kind of sitting Is that out more front. Expensive? Thank you. <laughs> I felt it coming. <laughs> a bit more. We can, we as part of the SD exercise, we can get. Uh, I've asked that question with this manufacturer, and, and uh, it's not like it's a, a huge uh, additional expense because it's a lot of the the fundamentals of the mechanism are the same. Yeah. But we will. That's a good question. We'll yeah. definitely let you know yeah. what that means. The question has to be asked, and we will be addressing that. Yes. And then, so to that point, is this one of those types of items where we don't necessarily need to make a decision, but we can maybe carry it in two different ways and then make a decision later on? Or is this going to be a decision we need to make earlier on? I think um, earlier on, okay. yes. Um, but we will be offering you know, some um, budgetary information so that it can be made. I think the distinction that John is making is, is really what the interior experience of the theater is. Yes. And the, the curved seats with the balcony you know, elements yeah. coming out from it are offering uh, maybe a more traditional yeah. feel. I like that a lot better. Yeah. Yeah. Myself, well, and something we haven't been showing in the blocking diagrams, and really we haven't started modeling here, is you know, here in these front corners of the room, what you typically see in the theater is, is some slightly angled walls to kind of the throat of the space. Um, out in front of the proscenium. And when those pull out a little bit, then you start to find spaces for ducts and maybe some circulation or something like that. So, you know, if, if we aren't constrained by a rec rectangle, a rectilinear multi purpose event space, and we start to think about this more as a theater space, uh, then, yeah, the architecture is a little bit different. Um, and, you know, we start to think about curving the whole house form, and I'll show you what that, you know, 
begins to feel like in a massing study from the outside. Um, yes. So is there no parterre there? Yes, well, just there is a parterre level in the back, and so what we were looking here is thinking about stepping down some kind of balcony level boxes. And again, thinking about that straight parterre in the previous scheme that goes down the sides, you know, if you're sitting here in a straight gallery, then you really want to be looking at the um, stage, right? Now, if, it's, if there's a thrust condition, you're not turned as far. But what we want to be looking at here is uh, more chevron-shaped boxes. And I'll, I'll show you an example here in just a second of where, you know, you kind of turn the people at that level just a little bit so that they're not having to look so far. And you know, it helps articulate the space. Um, you know, what we're not showing here is there could be some columns supporting those. Um, from our perspective, ideally, things get cantilevered off the side structure. Right, but um, yeah, we have to look at the rest of that and see where our structural grid actually starts to occur. It is kind of a fundamental difference that we wanted to show you and present to you with what we're looking at with the architecture of the house and what the, the feel of the space is. Um, you know, here we've obviously taken out the floors in the apartment space in the apartment building, so you get to see what the volume of that stage house really is. It also, I mean, the curve also probably results in the catwalks following the curve, mm -hmm. things like that. Uh, so it's you missed the catwalk. <laughs> and there was a balcony rail. <laughs> it doesn't turn up yet, but yeah, uh, lighting position along the front of the balcony. <clears throat> right. I, I mean, I think I want to underscore this is probably the first design decision we're putting in front of you that we, we can. <clears throat> We can give you cost feedback on how much more does it cost to get the more traditional or familiar theatrical environment. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Just a comment. Yes. I, I love it, and I think that it would not only provide a, a, a better feel for the inside of the theater, but I think um, in the way the look that you can produce in the lobby because it'd be rounded potentially, mm -hmm. could, potentially. could also be uh, create a different feel upon walking in instead of just walking into a wall. Right. So, I mean, either way, it, 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 it might allow for some more dynamically yeah. um, crafted spaces and shaped spaces. So <laughs> I, I love the suggestion. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, I think since we're still using the this, that type of seating, it doesn't really impact the flexibility of the space. Correct. This would still retract up and be stored underneath that parterre right. level. Then you still have the same amount of table space out there. That's right. I've, I've given myself an assignment <coughs> to get an order of magnitude difference in price in a couple of weeks. Thank you, John. Because we really need... Yeah, we, we do. Would, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, I would... We don't want to be going down later. Right. I mean, I yes. would think we, we, we need to pull the trigger on it, you know, as we move into DD. Laden SD, yeah. Laden well, yeah. SD, yeah. Yeah. yes, yeah. definitely before. Yeah. So right. if we're able to give you some preliminary or magnitude feedback when we see you in two weeks, mm -hmm. that may be a point at which right. we really seriously consider right. our decision. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. okay. Any questions? Here I found some reference images, and I don't know if these are a little dark, but this is the anthem in Washington, D.C. Uh, it's, a, it's a much larger house than what we're thinking. This this is 4,000, and most of it's general admission. These are all loose seats on the floor. They, they pack this with, for music events. But what they do have are these um, articulated balcony um, boxes. The, they actually have two levels here. And you can see here how they start to orient the, the patron you know, a little bit more towards the stage. Um, I, Wanted to give you a reference mm -hmm. image for what that's like. Yeah, that's our project. That's an FDA project. That's an FDA project. So, um, but very, I mean, you know, it's, John, it's, it's, a, it's a music space. It's a music platform. Yeah. 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 Um, but see, you know, you can see how the, st the structural columns kind of work mm -hmm. in between those, and you know, they project out. Um, they aren't completely cantilevered off the back wall. So this is maybe an aesthetic as far as kind of the columns and the and the boxes that would, we would likely use because you know, again we're looking at an economical 
finish system in here, so we're probably looking at painted steel columns and, and things like that. So, you know, this works on a lot of levels like that. And, um, and here, you know, they do have, you know, a low kind of uh, front wall and then a higher rail on the, um, at the edge there, because they do have a lot of standing events. But, um, yeah. Any questions about that? Now it's, it's okay to have voices on both sides. I was just whispering to Mark. I actually kind of yeah. like the modern rectangular. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, there are them, so. just different. Yeah. It's it's yeah. just different. Um, so, mm -hmm. what I wanted to show you here, just real quickly, are some of the graphics that we're going to be showing you later on. This was a graphic that we did, a section, uh, rendered section of the Panasonic, <laughs> kind of going back to that same theater. So that you know, you begin to see as we're showing you things, you know, how the follow spot works from the, the catwalk level. Uh, um, this is you know the, the parterre or the balcony level boxes extend to the stage. You know we'd be seeing something like that. But as we get further into the design and more detailed in the design, we're able to generate more detailed graphics to give you better ideas um, of things. So this is just a straight section uh, rendered. This is a uh, section generated out of the 3D model, like we're using here uh, for this project. So we begin to populate that. And um, this was actually, when we looked back at this the other day, interesting the way the Panasonic uh, proscenium wall actually um, is masked down so that, um, you know, here this structure really creates that proscenium, but when there are events that want kind of full open stage to house presence. Um, you know, they, they pull that back. And, and so rather than a hard proscenium wall in, in this design, it, you know, cool. it gave you a different sense of space. Um, so we're not, you know, even though the earlier uh, Can you section. Explain that again? I didn't get it. Well, so instead of a hard proscenium opening here and with a wall, yeah. this whole space is open to grid level height okay. and so when they want a show where the proscenium is is necessary they, they mask down to the sides to create that but and other that back yeah it's it's a movable partition yeah. that goes up and it really, so it reveals Am I the, uh, confusing that, things i don't well, want to confuse it's, things it's 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 a concept i think is specific to this type of theater and maybe not really applicable okay. all right we're you know the the, the the stage width is is at a minimum, and uh, you know the sort of the diagrams that I did sort of anticipated where, where we had to work in a wrapper around. Okay. So we're we're talking about a 35 foot wide proscenium, and then the wing space off of that to the to the 60 on either side, and yeah, we're going to have I, I believe uh, conduit rigging. Probably double purchase. I'm realizing that's a lot. Well, we're wondering thing. which. Well, that's, we, that's which a lot of thing. Okay. You know, but but there'll be there really won't. We've certainly done projects like John describes where we have a wider stage house and we have a, 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 a an open proscenium and and you have that look. Mm -hmm. But I don't think we have the width here. Okay. Given, and there's also a fire curtain. Because of like, yes. the yeah, things like that. Okay. But but that said. You know, not some. You know, you're probably going to use the full width, but a more a theatrical production might need more wing space, and you they would mask in from the 35 to effectively create more wing space. That kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, this is very cool. And, and well, I, I know it was just it was a different type of theater. Than know, sure it was right just an about. idea we were kind of uh, working with ourselves. You know, well, we've shown you all a hard proscenium. Um, maybe there's an opportunity for something more open between the house and the stage that we would obviously work with Joe and see if it meets your needs. So I, d I didn't mean to sidetrack us, but... Uh, <laughs> but, but also it's important to begin to see the kind of imagery that, that you'll have mm -hmm. for um, <coughs> publishing uh, what, what's happening. Yeah. So, and I, and I think, you know, the way we work in the 3D computer models, um, we can give you all you know, some very 
detailed graphics and people can begin to really understand the feel of the space and get excited about it. Um, so that's why I'm showing these, not to propose that we do a different style. Sorry. So then we, we, we quickly and very preliminarily, again, we're just getting into this. Um, so as we look at the existing building masses, um, not necessarily, again, using the existing shoe store uh, walls, but just looking at um, the massing. So this box is the straight seating configuration, right, that just goes back up and it's, it's rectangular in form. Now the exterior wall here is, would be built up from the top of the foundation walls and go all the way up. We've rendered it so that this is the existing shoe store volume and this is the new volume, but that doesn't mean that this is not necessarily a new full height wall. We just wanted to show you what the additional volume is going to be. And you can see that the height here of the house, as we are working at it with it right now, is right about the head height of the existing windows in the apartment building on the fourth floor. And you start to see, uh, at least in this view taken from the intersection, you know, that's the volume of the stage house popping up just a little bit above the apartment building. And as we go through this, we'll take views from other uh, parts of the street, of Main Street and Pearl Street, so that everybody can get a sense of kind of what this is going to feel like. And then the next is, I'll go back and forth a little bit so you can kind of see the difference. Oops. So there's the square, or the rectangular form. And there's the kind of shape of the house if we follow a, the curved seating and kind of to, you know, kind of design the form of, of the house rather than just taking the blocking diagram and extruding it. Um, I like the curve of the square. And yeah. the Pearl Street side is going to come out. It's not going to be stepped back like you showed it originally. No. It's going to come right out to the wall. Right now, right now, right now it comes out to the exterior. I if, like that if we, Okay. It makes it look more cohesive instead of a box I got it there. Yes. <coughs> you can do more with the outside design yeah. that way too. And tying it into the other building. <coughs> yes, there are a lot of opportunities that that presents. And you know, this is the mass of that uh, bank building across the street. This is the mass of the um, surf. And um, you know, so we'll be looking at what's across the street as well so that we get the full context. Yes, sir. Um, well, when you first said the thing about the curved seating, I said, oh, yeah, definitely that's better. But then that raised questions. And then you showed the 3D thing, mm -hmm. and the <clears throat> straight seating looked pretty good. So what's your thinking about why do you prefer the straight? I, I mean, I can I kind of, it's kind of a, yeah, yeah why I, you, I just want to make sure that, that anyone who wasn't speaking up felt uh, free to do so. <laughs> uh, it, it, the, to me, there's a, a, just an inherent kind of modernity right. to the images that, that, that John was showing of the theaters with the, with the straight theaters. Yeah. Uh, that, that said, you know, the familiarity, I think the, the, the um, drama, architectural drama of the curve, uh, uh, seating, I can see the attraction to that as, as well. But it, it is, you know, as, as, as had been said, it's a decision that we're going to have to make rather soon. Um, so it's really about the feel of the space. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, it is a more yeah. modern feel when you do the straight seating, believe it or not. It, it is. You know, it, it, uh, you, know, you think of, I don't know, these theaters that were built to the globe or something, you know, it's got the curve, it's kind of old fashioned in a way, but but if you globe like, you know, Shakespeare's Globe Theater, but if you, I'm just saying, you know, I don't think it's that easy, I don't think it's that clear cut what, what is the matter. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I, I personally like the curved seating, but even more so, I like the curved building. The I, like, I like that look, and I know it's still a lot more to design. I like probably even that as much or more than the actual idea of the curved seating, but obviously they go hand in hand. Right. Okay. 
but that's this personal is, opinion. This, this is why we were bringing it up, just to sure. see your reactions. Yes, Tim. So I have a question. I'm just wondering, are we, depending on what is ultimately decided, are we straying too far afield from what has been presented, um, not just cost, but then publicly through the feasibility study and um, and then I'm just again asking the question. I want to I want to make sure you're thinking about this um, in terms of we're moving from the black box concept, we're moving now to to having the stage. Now we're we presented and showed publicly to to people that a certain type of feel, a more modern, more contemporary type of uh, performing arts center type of venue. And I just want to make sure that that is in people's minds if you go more traditional. And just make sure that people are, are comfortable with that more traditional feel that may be developing. Well, and you don't have to have, it's not that you can't have the, the balcony level boxes, you know, can't they? <coughs> it's not that you can only have that with the curved seating. You can have that with the straight seating as well. So, um, you know, when I showed this, this doesn't have the curved seating, this has straight seating. This was to show you the examples of the, the boxes stepping down. Um, so it's a good point. You know, there is a, a change from the um, design concept. You know, that was presented earlier uh, because we are, you know, looking at fly space now that wasn't described before. So there are some differences to be considered. Do, do, Peter, do you have any thoughts on the straight versus the curve? You know, my first thought in seeing the curve design was that, that that's going to look and feel more familiar to people coming into the, to the space. Yeah. Uh, are there any examples of actually seeing that telescopic seating, the, the curve look and feel of it, just pictures of words? I'd be really curious. I, I, yeah, I, I can yeah, visually sure. in my mind and I've seen yeah, which, spaces sure. with the telescope that are straight. Yeah. And I the rendering is helpful, but if it was actually a I'm yeah, just we can my head around exactly the look and feel. We can, of what we can we do. show you something next time, but in yeah. the meantime, if people want to go to a website, Jezet, J E Y J E Y J E Z E T dot com, uh, they're the manufacturer that we were dealing with mostly. They're one of the ones that do the, uh, uh, the curve city, Not all telescopic uh, riser manufacturers can do the curve. Yeah, and I think you'll find. That all of their examples, curved and straight, all of those spaces look very contemporary. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I guess that was my. Po are we in look and feel? Is it that much different? Because I think when we see the curved on this rendering, all, you know, I have a instant vision of a vaudeville, you know, right, you know yeah. 1920. Right. Yeah. Whereas, are we just taking that kind of modern look of what I've typically seen with a straight and curving it? Yeah. And yes. I, I, think I just think that it's hard to. Sure. Okay. No, when no, we see that, it's like, oh, well, now we have a bundle house, whereas no. before, that's no. not really where we're going. You're right. We don't intend for those images to inspire, you know, a vaudeville type image. You know, we are still thinking of very contemporary yeah. and okay. modern okay. detailing and materials mm -hmm. um, just expressed, you know, with the curve. Yes. I'm still not sure, but I just wonder, the curve seating does evoke an older theater, an older space, maybe more comfortable, I don't know, but we are competing against mostly older theaters, you know, we're, it's the, it's the, and, and, you know, for audience and also maybe for even performers, you know, it's the Palace, it's the one up at Concord, the Lowell Auditorium, you know, they're all older. Should we do something that clearly distinguishes us in design from those theaters so that we stand out? I, that's, that's just a question I throw out. I don't expect any answers. I'm just, you know. A couple of days ago on PBS, I was watching a program on architecture. I mentioned it before, and this guy named Robert Adams that they featured, who's a traditionalist. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's a traditionalist with all modern materials. And to me, when I saw this, it really evoked what he was, they were showing and the way he works. It's like you're 
you're taking some traditional familiar designs that people are familiar with it that fit in with what is around you, but you're taking all modern materials and using and updating them and looking at it from a modern perspective. Yes. So I don't think that the fact that this curved steeping may have reflected back to vaudeville area, it's all a matter of what you're using for the steeping, how you do it, and what the context is of the modern materials. And to me, this looks a lot more dramatic than the square rendering does and makes it look a lot different too. So just two, two more points. One is, or questions. One is, when you go to that curve versus straight, are you losing any functionality of converting the space into multi purpose? Um, no, because we're still using the telescopic seating, and you know, so we don't see okay. a difference there. So, no. so you, you get the same kind of Yes. And, and then, I'm sorry, and I haven't wanted to go there just right out of the gate, but it is the first question <laughs> I do have is understanding the cost to this mm -hmm. and the differential, and when you say order of magnitude, mm -hmm. understanding we have a certain budget that we're working with, Absolutely. and not having necessarily those variables, will we be able to say with confidence that we'll be able to go in a certain direction and then plug the other variables <laughs> in? Do you understand what I'm saying? Um, I do. I, I think we have to help you um, make this more objective. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, yeah. I think we're all, everybody's reacting like dislike, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. That's what I think John is, you know, was hoping asking for. Yeah. yeah. Um, but the takeaway is, we'll come back next time mm -hmm. and make it a little bit more objective as to what the advantages of one are over the other, what the cost of one is over the other, and whether. You know, those two things outweigh each other. Well, sir, I can certainly do my part in terms of the cost of the seating, you know, yeah. the, the relative cost. Yeah. So, and, and again, you know, I, I would, as you think about this, uh, and, you know, suggesting a traditional theater, I, I, think, I think you'll find, if you go to the Gisette website, that there is, there will be no theaters that look like Um, one of the things that I, with the, with the curved seating, and I agree that it gives that feeling of a little theater, but our design, because of what we have for budget and so on, is still going to be a lot of painted metal with some wood and yes. so on. So we're still going to get that modern feel, I think, in that way, yes. in the design. The yes. seating will not dictate the entire design. It'll just dictate how it's viewed, how the, the, the well, theater it's, the the stage is viewed and how and so on. A little I mean, bit different help experience with for yeah. the patron, right. you know, right. because all the patrons aren't necessarily you know sitting here. Right. Some right. of them, you know, you get kind of do a the wrap bit, around. Do a right. little bit of wrap around. I mean, it's right. slight more. Yeah. So we still have the balance of, of that kind of feel right. with the physical design of yes. wood and pink metal, and whatever. Uh, and however, it goes. What's so. the name of that theater? The one you're looking at. Um, I don't know. I just went on the Gisette side. Oh, Gisette. Uh, I went on the Gisette and looked at this particular seating um, and went to the uh, platform concepts and curved platforms, and that's what came up. So. And it was on the retractable, under retractable <coughs> platform. Yes. Um, I just wanted to respond quickly to what Tim said in terms of like making a decision that varied widely from the study. Uh, I think that we chose you folks because you suggested things that vary from the study that you think better serve our purposes. Right. So I'd ask the group to just kind of keep that in mind. Yeah. We're, we're already yeah. so yeah. far from the study. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 I mean, <laughs> unless, we, unless we want to go back to the no, second no, floor right here. We've lost that battle. No. It's done. I think there are certain things like the gallery space that obviously needs to be there for, for specific reasons. But when it comes to like making a decision like this, like, in terms of honoring that, I think it's I think it's unnecessary, um, but to uh, and just to respond to the the idea of the, the curve curve versus square, uh, I feel as though it, in one of our first conversations we discussed that we wanted to use modern materials, but that we didn't want an ultra ultra modern right. space. Right. 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 So I I think that we should just keep that in mind as well. I don't believe we're going to try to be. Creating the Boston Opera House here, just because we're doing 
curb seating. I think there's a lot of ways to make that feel more modern if that's the way the group wants to go. Uh, also, I feel like that design might differentiate more from Keith Center, from Keith Auditorium, because that doesn't really have that curb, and that's in town, as well as some of the local high schools. It makes it a big difference. There's a straight seating in the center of a lot of high schools, so it makes it less like a high school auditorium. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind for the group as well. Thank you. That was well said. So they're, they're good conversation. Yeah. More, more to follow up. Right. Um, cool. Yeah, well, we can this, avoid it out of this was the, <laughs> yeah. the last slide. I mean, the last thing was just to kind of reiterate, you know, where we are in the schedule. This was really the end of our programming phase. Um, you know, we're starting into our eight weeks of schematic design, and I think. We're in a really great position. We seem to have a lot of, you know, consensus on <coughs> most everything we've been talking about, which is wonderful at this point. We greatly appreciate that. It helps us be more efficient in what we're working through as a design team and what we can bring to you, you know, each and every two weeks. Yes. Now, since my eyesight is so bad that I okay. cannot see a word on that, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> it, 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 we have to make, yes. <laughs> I mean, that's why I have, even though it's the old one, I have this in front of me. We have a capital campaign committee tomorrow, and there'll be probably a quick update. But as far as, since, again, since I can't see that, as far as exterior design renderings, when does that come about on that schedule? Even though they're so, conceptual, even though they're so just we've conceptual. Been, we've been um, regularly in contact with Betsy. Betsy? Betsy. Betsy. That's okay. Yes. Sorry. Sorry. Betsy. Um, uh, she, I, I put her off. Right, she probably wanted it yesterday, she said. Yeah. Yes. No, longer ago than that. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, that pending the uh, feedback that we got this evening, uh, we would have a better idea as to whether the steering committee felt like uh, anything was ready to move forward. I might be jumping the gun a bit, but I would say I, our recommendation would be it's too early still. Mm -hmm. uh, start um, being able to share, selectively share uh, images. Okay. I think the, 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 the conversation we've had with, with Betsy is if we can engage donors in the design process and that we're not um, uh, misleading them in any way, you know, that, that that's, that's okay. That's a good story sure. to, to tell. But to get to the really polished renderings, that's the end of this phase. So sure. that's, we, we need to find somewhere in between. Somewhere in between. Sure. Um, that's, that's effective. Okay. Um, so, so to that point, um, I've been, Mary Lou has the updates, <laughs> giving updates of these differing graphics to, to uh, Betsy, and they will be you know, constantly updating different iterations for folders or collateral as, as necessary. So the, the, the capital campaign is getting these these, these visuals as, as they come. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're 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 um, well, being kept one sort of step behind. Once you see something, right, they see it. They're they're seeing it. But but I I really felt like it, it needed to be direction from the steering committee mm -hmm. to the capital campaign committee uh, with our recommendation. <laughs> yes. Is there going to be any discussion on the exterior building as part of this? Not today. Not today. Not today. This is a, that was as far as we've kind of gotten in, in uh, looking at the masking yet. So, um, I, you know, we're beginning that, and we will be doing that as we do the inside. So we'll continue to show you development of both meeting to meeting. In terms of just to summarize, the um, as we as we close out the programming portion of our, our meetings, the the big remaining issues are the trap space, which we know we can <coughs> carry for for a while, uh, the orchestra pit, uh, and allowing that to have the capacity to have a uh, approach to lift. In it, uh, which also would double, it sounds like, as the thrust. 
Especially if we're looking at that little addition to take the stair and elevator out, that frees up Created space the room. stage level. Yeah. Other, the, the um, general blocking and stacking of the program, it sounds like we're getting close uh, to, what, to what everyone wants. There are some adjacency issues that need a lot more exploration, like concessions and, and catering. Uh, we heard very clearly that uh, there need to be accessible toilets on every floor. Um, they don't need to be equally distributed, but on every floor, they, they need to be on, on, on every floor. Um, <coughs> did I miss anything? Uh, just to add the, the issue of uh, shell tower storage. Yes. Thank you. Yes. yes. Or just a shell. So it's, again, it's not whether you're having a shell or not, but whether you want us to design in the, the provisions for adding a shell. That's, that's at a, down the road. Later date. That it, oddly enough, what, it, it's actually removing square footage because the right. second floor is going to lose. Yeah, that's why. Square it's a, it's a yeah. 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 Well, given what you said, it seems like the shell is almost a necessity, isn't it? I mean, you said that people playing back a little further couldn't be heard. I mean, that's sort of a problem. Yeah, we, if they're behind the proscenium, then we need to, you know, provide for that sound energy to be reflected out into the house properly. Right. So it's not even a totally functional theater. For an acoustical right? performance, right. If you have for amplified oh, performance, yeah, then okay. you don't any, use the shells. It's, right. it's for, for acoustical. an actual concert, you wouldn't need the orchestra shells. That's right. For any sort of yeah. chamber music or acoustical, sort of acoustical like. guitars or something like that, yes. That's what Sorry. the extension of the stage was for as well. But well, that's my understanding. Yes. Well, yes. well the rest the rest he right. filled this in, correct me if I'm wrong. As I recall the conversation, we talked about recitals with a smaller audience, and mm -hmm. then we had the thrust. But I, I believe that this is where you should you should <coughs> chime in. What started to tip the scales is you guys gave the example of uh, the Vienna Boys Choir mm -hmm. on stage as as one where there were it was an acoustical environment and an audience environment where the, the music was on stage. And I believe that that got people to thinking more about the shell than we had minutes before. You know. If, yeah, I think there's a number of considerations. One is what is the depth of the thrust forward the proscenium so that if we're considering acoustic performances, we're not fitting 90 piece orchestra on the stage, and therefore we're talking about the acoustical performances of this chamber or if it's choral or if it's whatever, what is that distance from the proscenium line forward uh, to the downstage to the, to the edge? What type of performances do, could be put on that thrust? Uh, secondly, uh, as we did talk about with the Vienna Voice Choir, we've done them uh, a million times in different theaters. Sometimes they are upstage in the proscenium they're not fans of microphones, but sometimes a little bit, just to reinforce it a little bit, is uh, is appropriate. Um, and sometimes not, depending on the house and depending on many other things, it, it, it may or may not be, it be uh, necessary. Um, there's also uh, have been situations where we have used portable uh, orchestra shells, so not the full. Fly. I mean, what we're talking about is like a full fly, movable, 25 foot tall, I think the real deal. like yeah, the real deal. deal. Yeah. Whereas um, portable shells are an option. So if this is something where we're saying, well, maybe this is two or three times a year where we need to have reflection and uh, getting that to be considered for this acoustic performance, is it better off to be able to bring in unload or sh shell pieces off a truck that stick together, you know, yeah. you know and save the, the deck space, the 250 square feet, whatever, <coughs> plus the cost of 
the shell. You know, I think it, it's cost benefit of how many performances and what are the other options. It's not that we don't have um, an option to make, whether it be uh, performance logistical considerations of moving uh, the performers downstage as far as possible, get them in the room, um, or renting a shell not the same type. You know, I don't want to say that the, the type of shell that could be rented would be the same thing that we're talking about here. But this really, you know, uh, extensive shell uh, system. But I think it's important to, to consider that, that some of that can be accomplished uh, in a couple of different ways. Yeah, and typically New Hampshire has a shell that they use over at the Keith that they store at the Keith to set up each time at the concert. So there is one right in town. Yeah, and Joe may have some commentary on you know some of those considerations too. But I think part of uh, we're not talking generally speaking about large ensembles or large <coughs> uh, groups that would be uh, acoustic performances in the space. So how what what could we fit uh, upstage at the proscenium? I think is a, is a valuable consideration. <coughs> Does it really come down to looking at the cost of the shell, the you know two floor storage versus if we're going to have half a dozen or less um, shows a year that are going to utilize that? <coughs> it doesn't sound to me like it would be cost justifiable. It would be more cost justifiable to bring it in than to actually construct it. Construct and lose the space. And lose the space. Yeah, and the, you know, <coughs> Right. Do it and um, spend that money somewhere else. Yeah, I mean, if it was like, hey, this, you know, <laughs> open checkbook, sure, let's put it in. You know, yeah. no, but I think <laughs> <laughs> uh, Tim says, we're going to party again. Um, <laughs> that, right. That, you know, I'm not anticipating <laughs> a situation <laughs> where we would have to say no to a performance so that we would yeah. ruin a performance or, or have it be substandard. If there was, you know, de again, depending on how much room we've got upstage of the team, and also there are ways to, to tackle that challenge. It may not be as perfect as having our own quarter million dollar flying 25 foot acoustical tower, but there are other things that can be done to improve that situation on a case by case basis. Okay. Uh, I'll check in with our, our uh, rental company about, you know, what's the cost of bringing it in? Because obviously, that would be a cost that if a, if a group is coming in, that would be they would have to go rent it. So, what what type of cost would we be putting on them to have to bring that in? I'll find that out. So, the, the, the piece of okay. so I may make a recommendation. Uh, the, the, the thing you you don't uh, the thing you don't get when you when you bring in a show like that. Uh, and I'm not necessarily arguing you one way or, or, or another, but just the thing you don't get is the the rigged overhead panel. Right. It would be uh, floor standing towers. Yeah. So, so it's sort of part of the system, but not the whole system. I think looking to the future, ask us to go ahead and design in the storage capacity for it right now. And we can keep testing that idea as we move forward. Uh, and if we find we really need that 250 square feet on the second floor, then we can revisit the conversation. You're not committing to buying a shell. Sure. You're just committing to a 250 square foot room that happens to be very tall. So. <laughs> Something else? Yeah, I'm into that. Okay. Okay. Well, I am, I am not just checking my email here, guys. I want to. <laughs> <laughs> in the way, um, to go to Gisette, if you go to a website, Wenger Corp, W E N G E R Corp, dot com, uh, there is uh, find. It's hard to do it on the phone, but there's the Maestro Acoustical Shell. <laughs> Don't look around on the rest of that site because you're going to find all kinds of other toys you're going to find. Tim is not going to let you know. <laughs> In but fact, I will send you an image. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think, I, think I, I hope it, it helps to, you know, we're, you know, we talk about a shell. What does that mean exactly? So the full blown shell with the overhead. The ceiling and all that that, that Joan is talking about, that I'm talking about, that's the quarter of a million bucks, is the Maestro shell. The Wenger also has something called the Diva, 
which is basically the same thing with, for, with a larger space. Um, and if you look elsewhere in the Wenger site, I'm guessing yeah, that the really portable good. shells you're talking about are basically just like castered walls with a little bit of a, a tip top a little, yeah. that is better than nothing, but it, it, it goes back to Jonah's point in that it doesn't provide that overhead Correct. reflection. Yeah. So uh, this time around, no homework for you guys, uh, other than reflecting on, sorry, no pun intended, on the conversation we were just having. Um, uh, we will uh, obviously be convening the tech subcommittee uh, for uh, a conversation next Wednesday. Uh, the next time we're here, in two weeks in advance of that, we will be on site with our full engineering team uh, doing a, a Detailed, uh, further detailed assessment from, <coughs> from their perspective, uh, and of course we'll continue advancing the schematic design. Okay. Now Can I ask what time that meeting was set for? The tech subcommittee time has we not, not been set. Okay. So, um, uh, it, because yeah. you, you can't come earlier, right? I mean, there's a 4 p.m. request. Uh, I, we so haven't gotten that far yet, but it's trying to be. Okay. Yeah. 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 It's also one where you don't necessarily need to go over and run for the same thing yeah. okay. as an online. Perfect. Yeah. And just one other note on the Wenger site, the legacy shell is the portable. So yeah. Diva, Maestro, and Legacy. Yep. Yeah. And there's a box full of these. Yeah, so we've printed All of those are the new ones? Yes. Yeah. These okay. are the prints for the presentation tonight. Okay. Okay. Awesome. A little bit larger as well. Okay. okay. So do you have a whole bunch of those? Yes. Okay. All right. okay. Is there any other questions? And I guess, is there a need of next week? Did we make that decision yet about next Wednesday? So I think we should meet next week to make sure that we're all tracking and trending in the same direction. Um, unless, I mean, unless the group doesn't feel like it's, it's necessary for saying, I don't think there's anything critical to, to be discussed or time sensitive, but I don't want to slip on this timeline. Mm -hmm. Well, why don't we schedule it? And so it's scheduled. And then and scans, then, okay, if, yeah, it's I'll reach out to everyone and get their thoughts. And if there's consensus, I might send an email to cancel. Anything else? Just want to say thank you all. This thank is you. Is no, no, thank you. This was great. Wonderful group. We the the progress it. is, yeah, it's very interesting. But, um, motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second? Second. Thank you. Thank you. That was a real time. Bye, guys. Good. I uh, haven't got a status.